Yes, we are, we are live. Yeah, I got. It's going really slow for some reason. So I'm going to go ahead and say it's live. How about that? It's live. Okay, no. we're going to go live. Um, so, how's it going, everybody? I'm the Uncanny Omar, and this is Near Me Condition, the home of Collected Editions. Uh, today, I'm interviewing two gentlemen that are working on a really cool and interesting project. Uh, this is Ryan to my right. How are you doing, sir? Hello. Thanks and for having us. Down below is Luke. What's up? How are you, sir? Uh, so, yeah, this uh, we are talking about Stanley's Alliances, which is an original graphic novel. And right now, there is a Kickstarter that's going on. I believe there's a couple of days left to go. But this was sent to me while I was in Japan, so I haven't had a chance to open it yet. But I want to know what uh, what brought this on and how how this project got started and then what you two gentlemen are doing with this particular project. Ryan, you want to hit it? Uh, sure, yeah. So um, Alliances is, the, is a new universe of characters that we co-created with Stan um, over the course of many years and was released originally as a... New York Times bestselling Audible original, which is an audio drama with Yara Shahidi. And then we did a prequel with Will Wheaton. Um, and it was a global release, actually. So you say in Japan, um, one of our main markets was the Japanese market with the original um, audio drama original. Uh, and this is our third um, in the series uh, called Orphans, which is really a jumping on point because this is our first kind of ex exploration of the cosmic side of the Alliance's story. And alliances really as a universe is built on things very near and dear to like where we are as a culture today and things like AI and the impact of the internet and how identity is shaped by um, technology. And these are things that Stan and Luke and I would talk about in depth for, for very long periods of time in terms of how we could shape and make the most exciting stories and characters that reflect sort of our modern curiosities and some of um what were Stan's concerns about how technology might impact uh, humanity. And I think, uh, Luke, you've had, you know, you go back with Stan many decades. So maybe you could, you know, just give a sense of that side of it. Well, the um, in the prologue uh, of Alliance's Orphans, which is what we're talking about here, um, we introduced the inventor and the inventor is someone, you know, he 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 can create these amazing powerful devices and he just sort of he, he doesn't always consider how they're going to be used or what the ramifications of those are, are and this all sort of was born out of a conversation i had with stan a long time ago about the internet because when the internet first came along he was really excited he thought you know here's this opportunity to break down all these barriers and for us to share ideas and for people to communicate and understand each other and you know that's he he thought it was going to kind of help humanity and become more empathetic and and connected and instead um you know flash forward 15 years later and we're having conversations about the, how mankind has turned the internet into this you know tool for division and misinformation and tribalism and you know all the ways that it's really hurting us and it's not really helping us empathize it's actually making us more desensitized and and you know more hurtful to each other and and you know the way it's sort of turning people against each other and that was sort of the that was the technology where this was all sort of born out of like that was that the conversations around that particular technology but then you can just sort of broaden that out into a larger conversation about technology in general and how you know when you're sort of standing in the light of creation you 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 step into it because you are dreaming about what's possible and and then a lot of time then, then you put that in the hands of people and people have this way of you know you don't really have any control over what happens to it at that point i mean people have this way of messing it up you know how long ago did this idea start uh, between you, uh, you all and uh, Stan, I'm going to say 2014. I want to say somewhere in there. 
probably okay. mm-hmm. was when we started having the conversations. Um, and then it started getting probably picking up in earnest around 215, uh, 2015. Um, and I mean, then audible came along for the first, the first, this is the third in a series. Um, so the first work in the series now, saying that orphans is designed as something that people can step into. You don't have to read the prior works in order to understand it. It was designed as a, as a jumping on point for, for audiences. So, but the first work in the franchise was a trick of light, which was an audible original came out in 2019. Um, and we finished the manuscript uh, while Stan was still with us. And that project really started in earnest, probably around 2017, but we had already done, you know, years of, development before we even sort of picked out a story and decided to make that the first story we told in this universe. And when we were developing with Stan, it was, we didn't really want to, um, we didn't have an end game. Cause I mean, the classical thing to do in particularly in Los Angeles is, you know, you put together a treatment for film and television. Cause all you want to do is make a, you know, film or a TV. And then you take that treatment around and chop it around to Hollywood and hope somebody makes it. And we very specifically did not want to do that. We wanted, we, we weren't sure what medium this was going to be first told in. And indeed we oh, were okay. surprised when it was audible and that wasn't, and that didn't come on until we had already been working on it for years. So when we, de- when we started developing this, we were just sort of, you know, it was Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, we were just sort of creating characters and scenarios and storylines and, you know, working on the themes and, you know, having fun with potential technologies and things like that. I mean, that that sort of, it was, it started out as kind of a creative exercise um, and then it just kept going and getting and bigger. It was, and it was nice because, you know, with Stan, you know, his curiosity was sort of endless and, um, we would go out and we would do our research because we really wanted to root it in, in the real world. And it was something that was important for him too. And, you know, we would go to the Stanford human interaction lab where the Oculus was born and come out with, you know, not only the technology, but also sort of like the, hum- the human aspects of how technology, uh, how we interact with technology and the effects it can have on us. And then from there, we could create characters, which is why, you know, we have a main character in Orphans um, who's introduced in the prologue that Bill um, uh, painted named mm-hmm. Nia and Nia is a very fully formed AI a- as a character. And it's, it's really built off of not only like futurists point of view, but like how, wh- how do computers and humans, how could they interact if there were to really be, you know, a near f- science fiction universe where humans and computers would start interact on a daily basis. And now flash forward to where we are today. And AI is like a big, huge topic, you know, top of mind of everybody. And this is, you know, something we were discussing, you know, many, many years ago. And it's something that Stan, you know, could see around the corner and say, this is something we should be focused on. You know, this is the modern gamma ray. This is the modern Fantastic Four go off into space and can actually see the moon for the first time before we send anybody to the moon, you know, that kind of thing. Um, this was, you know, uh, for us, this is a very, very, like this is the culmination of many years of work because we're seeing for the first time in Orphans and in Trader's Revenge, the work we put into with Stan, the first writings we did brought to the page. And that's what makes this Kickstarter particularly exciting because this is like a real moment for the Alliance's um, uh, universe. So in, um, in sequential order, because you mentioned this is the third story, right? Um, have the other two stories been collected anywhere? Uh, like, or do you well, all see that happening in, a, uh, well, in, in, this, initial, in this format? The initial um, A Trick of Light started out as an Audible original. It was a New mm-hmm. York Times bestseller. And then about six months later, it came out in hardcover. And then six months after that, it came out in softcover as prose novel. And then the second in the series, A New Reality, was read by Will Wheaton um, as an Audible original. And Mm -hmm. then there were Orphans. Now, we took some of uh, A New Reality prose and put it into the special features in the back of Orphans. So there is some, you can read some of that story. Um, because the main character in A New Reality is William Ackerson is one of the main characters in Orphan. So it's, you know, it's kind of his origin okay. story is A New Reality. So we took that chapter and put it and put it into Orphans. So uh, this is the first th- this is the first appearance of these characters 
ever mm -hmm. in com in comics. And this is also the first, as Luke mentioned, the inventor who is the sort of cornerstone of the of the entire franchise. He this is his first appearance in Trader's Revenge and in Orphans. So that's okay. one of the reasons I think this is a pretty cool kind of like jumping on point um, for for readers. But yeah, yeah, certainly for us, like this is one of those things where Luke was saying, because of the way we developed the project, we're able to then work inside of different mediums and kind of like fit stories and characters, what we think is best for that specific medium. So for the audio stuff, we really wanted to, and Stan particularly really wanted to have the listener participate as the artist in their own imagination. That was something that he really was um, big on. And then for orphans, as an example, for we really wanted to find two artists to work with that could bring to life, you know, visually these characters. Um, and that's, we were just lucky to get Bill and Sleem on, you know, to do that. Okay. Right, we're, we're, uh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No. Oh, I the, the reason I, I asked the question a little bit earlier about um, were the other two chapters or parts of the story, had they been retold in graphic novel format is that I, I have seen that before with audio uh, books. Like uh, what was yeah. it? I think it was the Wolverine story that they eventually turned mm -hmm. into a, a graphic novel later on, but it originally started as an audible story. Um, but so this is the first graphic novel. Yeah. In, set in this world. That's well, cool. and, and the, uh, the ash can, I mean, we have the prologue, which is in the graphic novel. It's also separately an ash can, um, that's got all of the art with, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz and mm -hmm. that particular story, something that was basically the first thing we wrote was Stan because it's kind of the, the inventor's origin story yeah. as you were. And the inventor is an orphan. So what orphans are is, um, in this corner of the galaxy, the hive is this kind of dominant species that's wiping out everyone else. And when they take out a planet, they wipe out all the intelligent life, but they keep one member of the species alive um, as a kind of geologic, uh, uh, excuse me, a genetic artifact. And they, they're the lone survivor of their species. There's, you know, they're, they're the last ones. That's why they're the orphans. That's, that's kind of where that concept comes from. So the inventor is an orphan and then a number of, you know, the team of characters that carry us through the rest of the book, they are also orphans. And so they're kind of have a fa found family bond with each other um, because they're all on, you know, they all have this profound tragedy in common. So I, I have to ask this question because now I'm really curious. Uh, both of you are writing the story, right? And, and both of you worked with Stan on the story. So how how does that work? Like with three writers on the book, like well, who's in charge of what? Is there like, well, when somebody when, in charge when of Stan, script? When, when Stan was with us, he was in charge. Okay. And <laughs> we would do. <laughs> <laughs> whatever rightly so <laughs> um and you know there there was you know there's the sort of the scripting and the world building so i mean the, the way it would work is initially stan and i would have conversations about things and we after that conversation actually in particular about the internet i mentioned earlier i kind of we started mm -hmm. coming up with the idea of the inventor and when i walked out of his office okay. i realized that he would um i had something that stan would work on with me and i always wanted to make something with stan so i got home and i tried to come up with as much cool stuff as i can and then i brought it back to him and then he's like oh, you know and then he gave me some direction some other characters some whatever get rid of this keep this and that's mm -hmm. we worked that way for a little while where he would you know i would i would get into his office for half an hour we'd work on stuff and then i would go off and work on it uh, by myself to further develop it. Cause I always wanted to be bringing back to him. I, I wanted to respect his time. And when I came back to him, I wanted to have creative value that I was bringing. And once the world started getting kind of big and, uh, you know, it, it got to the point where I understood I needed a uh, brainstorming partner, um, to kind of work with me in between sessions with Stan. And that's when I reached out to Ryan, who's an old friend and we started working on it. I brought him in, introduced him to Stan you know, Stan liked Ryan. So he was sort of in the ball pin as it were. And then we, uh, we would just sort of create it from there. When it comes to scripting individual stories, the, the ash can, the, um, the bit that Bill did the art to, that was a script that Stan was actively involved in the rest of the book. 
is from the story development and character development that we did with Stan and Ryan and I wrote it the, with the artwork of uh, Sleeman Kondrasky. And then in terms of Ryan and I's um, working dynamic, you know, I wrote a few pages, I throw it over to him. He changes stuff. He sends it back. He'll write a few pages. You know, you just kind of go back and forth and it all kind of blends together, you know, because uh, the, the rest of the story thinks it's another 140 well, pages. So, well, you know, one of the one of the advantages of doing and this is one of this is by design, the way that it was the story, this whole this whole storyline was built and all of these characters, some of which we haven't even, you know, released to the public yet. This is built with architecture to be able to invite collaborators in. That's how Alliances was meant to be. And um, that was something intentional by the three of us with Stan, or the two of us with Stan, because, um, you know, this is a big, a big, these are some big ideas, big themes. And science fiction particularly was something that I think, you know, Omar, you, you touched on this with, um, one of the omnibuses of like tales of suspense, right. Or amazing fantasy, those early, those early sci-fi kind of like twilight zone style um, serials that Stan would work on. Those are like kind of a corner of that, of the world. That's not superhero. And it's something that was um, important for us to really d dive into on this project. Cause we really wanted to make good science fiction and with best in class collaborators and people like uh, Bill and Will and Yara, but also, you know, companies that we really respect like Audible or Dynamite. And um, that's where having the kind of contours framed out with many years of development allows people like Luke and I to be able to bounce things back and forth or invite other co-authors in, um, you know, downstream or artists. So it's a different kind of method. I mean, I'm not used to it, but I, I, I learned a lot from... Luke and uh, in working with Luke on this project and particularly, you know, over the years of working with Luke and Stan. Stan was a very good editor, you know, and that's one of the things I think people forget. Like, you know, he he's able to put together a team, not just on paper, in the real world too. So mm -hmm. that was something as I, I learned a lot. Hey, you're Omar. on um you, you're on mute, Omar. Or you're uh maybe off stream. Let me just message you. It's just you and I, Luke. And Omar yeah. is stuck in the machine. <laughs> this happens. <laughs> Spoiler, spoiler alert for everybody out there in the audience. This this is something very similar happens in A Trick of Light. So you can download that, read it, and find the page in which this exact scenario happens. <laughs> Omar, gotcha. Are you back? You're talking, but we can't hear you. I feel like this is a good time for me to plug my panel. <laughs> Can I plug my panel? Are we still alive? <laughs> yes, you are still alive. Red Sonia, 50th anniversary panel. Uh, Comic-Con, the 21st, 1130 to 1230. Come, be there. We're going to show some exclusive footage from the I movie. Get... You know, Are you back well, this yet? Is a... This ahead. is a good moment to explain that Luke also oversees and has uh, been part of the Red Sonia um reboot since the early 2000s a character that is near and dear to luke and has takes care of the entire rights for yeah <sighs> jimmy palmiotti amy chu amanda connor dan panosian it's gonna be fun come okay <laughs> well i can look in the comments while uh yeah no i know he's trying to reset some things Omar, should we like sign back in or what do you want to do?
Nick Omar is coming back. Yes, this is uh, so we'll keep Ryan Silver we'll keep we'll keep here with uh, Mink Condition. We'll We're going to be interviewing we'll Omar, Uncanny Omar. He'll be joining I've been us. Wanna, also. I want to know everything about his Japan, his, his trip to Japan. <laughs> so I'm hoping that this is what comes back. <laughs> I know this was discussed this weekend, but I want to hear He's more. He's still not here. I still can't hear you, man. This happened to us like on Friday too. Well, does anybody have any favorite Stanley Golden Age stories <laughs> from the uh, from your omnibuses at home? Man who could fly. That one was good. One of the first mutants. <laughs> Uh, Luke, this is a question for from James. Wants to know if the Red Sonja movie is coming to theaters. I certainly hope so. We're 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 wrapping up on uh, post, and we've got to get our uh, special effects in, and then we're going to be in conversations with distributors, and then we'll let you know. That's that's the hope. The guitar is a Nash from uh, from Germany. It's a small, like German brand. I don't even think they make them anymore. My grandfather was a. Uh, guitar um case maker i don't know if you knew that luke i did not know about your ancestry guitar. and guitar and guitar make, case make, make guitars so that's his case <laughs> uh would you rather be crushed by red sonia's thighs or arms i don't uh, think it's ever been asked <laughs> i mean okay. we're really asking <laughs> well, i i'll i will give a, a a pleasant eulogy at your funeral then um, you know, that Stanley documentary, actually Luke, um, Luke's, Luke had a student documentary that he made in the early two thousands with Stan that, um, was incorporated into that doc in the opening. I don't know, Luke, what part of the, the, uh, Oh yeah. It was in the first documentary. two minutes. It's the, uh, conversation about, um, it's the, it, it, it's, he goes, he says, um, we're a product of all the things we've experienced, seen, read, and heard in our lives. And then there's a separate bit where he talks about perseverance, and it's close in that sort of montage uh, that comes right after the, the opening bit. And um, I shot that with him when I was a film student at NYU um, the day I met him. And it kind of hit me that, like, you know, if he was sitting there and you told him in the year 2000 that these film students that were shooting him, uh, that 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 was what was going to be, you know, the audio in the opening two minutes of his, of his Disney documentary. I think he probably would have, he would have been surprised. I don't know if that, I, I think it, that might've shocked him. Mm -hmm. You know, Stan, Stan was never angry in his work because I think he was so happy with his work, but I will say there was one time, and this is in, um, if you purchase um, a trick of light, we talk about this in the afterward um, in terms of our working with him, but uh, we brought him in some material and I will say he wasn't angry. He was just forceful because he said, you know, this doesn't work. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. But if you remember, Luke, he came up he with came the whole idea in, in the room around Nia rebooting mm -hmm. the whole concept. And like, I don't know, I left, I don't know, Luke, you, you probably were similar. I left like completely shell shocked. I was like, Oh my God, Stan did like any of what we just brought in. But then I was like, Oh my gosh, in five minutes, he fixed every flaw. Yeah. But it was, a little more, I mean, yeah. you know, that was also after we had kind of come in with a certain story to audible and done the, like we, you know, yeah, well, yeah. we were, we were um, apprehensive just because we had sort of sold audible a certain story and Stan just, just looked at it again and said, you know what? No, I don't like this. I don't want to do changed. this. Like this. And he flipped it all on its head in, you know, pretty quick. He changed, um, changed, his, changed his mind. But then, you know, like yeah, a lot of allowed. people, he was, he he was allowed, allowed to. And yeah. well, it's one of the reasons we, we, we also bring in somebody like Bill, like Bill is very um, particular about how his art is rendered and what every brushstroke is clearly defined. And if he doesn't like it, he'll just redo it. 
you know? And that's one of those things where you kind of know you're working with a great artist. I mean, obviously Bill and Stan are, had already been, have cemented their legacies, but like, it's, it's amazing to see the fearlessness in which it is to abandon and re and start over from the blank page, even if, you know, just to continue to iterate that kind of, th that really is, is a lesson I think for anybody who's out there kind of trying to create is to you know, mm -hmm. not be so precious with your ideas because new ones will always come. You guys don't even need me. I went to go get my laptop. And oh, there you are. <laughs> you guys are oh, here. Yeah, I was I was listening the whole time, and that's, uh, I was waiting for you all to get done. I'm, I'm so sorry about that. I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, so I went to get my laptop and knock on wood. I think this one's okay. This looks great. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, I was listening. I, and I... I, I I didn't even need a segue because I really wanted to talk about some Red Sonia with you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but I was uh, letting you finish up. So, and I'm glad they were asking about Stan and how all that started too. So that story's out there now. That's cool. And now I have to ask, how long has it been since you've been working with the Red Sonia property? Well, the my company uh, has sort of always controlled it because my father used to control the Coney and the barbarian rights with some partners and they did mm -hmm. the original licensing deals with marvel and some other people and then there came a point where they just wanted to put each of the major characters in the library into their own company and mm -hmm. so that's kind of what happened there so my father controlled the company before i did i grew up with it i've no you know it was sort of birth you know so mm -hmm. she's sort of always been there um, I, I got involved in around 2004, 2005, right when we started making the comics with Dynamite. That's kind of what I was working for Stan. And then uh, we did the deal to publish uh, Sonya with Dynamite. And that's kind of I went off and, and focused on that. So that that's that's, I guess, my my that's a quick version of my history with the character. That's a that's a long time. You're talking about, oh, my gosh, um, almost 20 years. Right. You got yeah. two decades of the character. That's great. Yeah, it always, um, it, you know, since uh, not that they really were crucial to each other, but the, the early adventures of Conan and Red, Red Sonja together, like, I was like, man, one day I'd love to see all this stuff reprinted, like the cro the crossover I issue. Is. I mean, it's in between, in between theirs and ours. Um, so, I mean, I think. Yeah, it, think it is. You're right. It, I mean, we're, we're putting out a big reprint too. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's, it's all covered. It's all there. I think we also did a crossover with the Conan, you know, the Conan people are ultimately the people that bought Conan from the library uh, 20 some odd years ago. Um, I, we, we did a crossover with them a little while ago. It's always possible. We'll do another, you know, it's just oh, sort of great. never out of the question that I, you know, at some point we'll, we'll circle back. I'm sure. I think the last one we did, uh, Gail, Gail Simone wrote, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah, she did. Um, I was a big fan of her run on Red Sonja, too. Solid. Well, we do, we're, doing a, we're doing a book with her. And we've got a novel. Oh, yeah? Her first novel, yeah, uh, that's In, coming uh, out orbit. Okay. There's an announcement on it, but, you know, it didn't make, you know, huge press because novels are – but I, we, we do. It's awesome. We actually just got the notes back from the uh, editors in the last – week so i've i mean and the notes on a novel are are it's a lot it's a lot i haven't even really been able to dig in yet oh my gosh i could do another interview on this because i'm i i, I get excited about this stuff I, i'm a big fan of red sonia you guys have one of my favorite writers writing uh her current run uh torin uh, grumbeck yeah. She, yeah yeah that, that lady kicks ass like everything she's written is solid. So I've read the, well, I think I've read we have the Walter first. doing the, uh, we have Walter doing the art and he's such a natural at this point with the character. He's been doing it. You know, he did Gail's run, you Gail's know, run. and he mm -hmm. some stuff for me too. And so, you know, I think it, it's been, it's been pretty seamless. The stuff that they've been putting in, I've been real happy with. Um, I think the first issue is coming out on the 19th of July. So we might as well mention that issue. Number one's coming out. Yeah. I got to read that in the free comic book day. Uh, both are solid, so I can't wait to see what she does with the series and and where it goes from there. And and there is an omnibus that's coming out. I uh, believe it's later this year, right? The Red Sonja omnibus. Oh, uh, that's for the best of. Yeah, I mean it's it's not exactly. I mean omnibus, I guess is one way to put it, but it, it's literally like, you know, 
four some odd stories that Roy wrote. There's like two stories I wrote. There's a couple that mm -hmm. Gail wrote. There's some that Mark wrote. There's some that uh, Oming wrote. I mean, we just, it's, it's got, it's the best of, which I curated myself. So I'm. You know, oh, nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is so cool. Um, maybe when that comes out, I'll have I'll, I'll have I'll have to get you back uh, to kind of see how that all came together, yeah. and what made you choose certain story arcs uh, over others. That that's always going to be a difficult job, like choosing best up, right? Like uh, what what you determine. Yeah, I mean, I did want it to just be all my own work, but I did have to let some other people. <laughs> <in it. laughs> like if you put me in charge of like best of X Men, I'm like I can't do it. I have to like release a ten volume library. Like that's the only way to do yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the the Alliance book that that is coming out, it's it's been uh, funded already. I did leave a link in the description of the video, um, and you just click on that if you want to check out. They have different tiers for that particular book. But my question is always the same: When uh, Dynamite does these kind of Kickstarters, will this book be available at retailer later on to order through Diamond, for example? Um. Yes. Okay. You want, to, you want to hit that one, Rye? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely is available through Diamond. Uh, now, the graphic novel uh, is. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons that for us it was important to do this as an OGN, and Nick was, you know, integral in Nick, the publisher of Dynamite, is that, you know, we're all comic book. You know, Luke's been in the comic book business for basically oh. his whole life. I've been a comic collector my entire life. My uncle owned a com my other uncle owned a comic store. You know, it was important to us to create printed work that could be part of to help support, you know, local comic stores, um, you know, in this kind of digital age. So we are available at all comic stores and bookstores and, you know, at the, at the, you know, at, at your order. If you want to put on your pull list, I think Diamond will happily fulfill it. Okay. Where the UP how the UPS strike affects that, I don't know. But you know, there's a UPS strike. Oh my god! Yeah, you can't yes. win. You can't. You can't win. You can't win, Luke. I'm in the middle of the writer's product. strike. And the actors may be yeah. going on a strike too out here. So, yeah, the actors just went on strike just now. Did they? Strike? Well, we were, maybe that's what brought my internet down. I don't know. <laughs> like apparently they just hey. they just went on strike. That just broke uh, a few. What is what is exclusive to the Kickstarter? Luke mentioned is the, for, is, the, is, is the traders. Is the There's a couple of exclusives to that, which is the Virgin Art cover by Bill. But uniquely, and this is something I think gets missed sometimes. This is interiors by Bill, which is you know unusual, mm -hmm. and it's something that Bill was particularly excited by. To, to do it was something that we were you know there's only one person on our list to kind of bring these pages to life because we had these scripts like we mentioned that stand scripted mm -hmm. with us for years we've been holding on to these and who could bring this to you know life in the most creative way it could only be bill um so the trader's revenge ash can is the only place to buy that comic book um and that's the first appearance of the inventor the orphans the entire set, the entire set of characters from A Trick of Light. So it's it's a specialty item um, that we're really proud of. And if there are any collectors out there, you'll know the significance of the title Trader's Revenge, which was um, you know the first story that Stan ever wrote. In, uh, and the significance yeah. of the name uh, of the word uh, Ashcan too <laughs> for also collectors. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for collectors out there yeah, uh, I'm, kind of, I'm excited to get a copy myself I mean it may sound like weird but I, I like getting my I mean because we get copies I mean I, otherwise I wouldn't have you know I'm just I'm glad I get a copy of the ash can I encourage everyone else to too yeah we think it's yeah. like for us it's, it's, it's a real it's 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 really the fulfillment of you know decades long of work um and is the cornerstone. And, you know, Luke, you just talked about this. Like you've been working with Red Sonia, you yourself for half the life of the character. We're here for the long run on alliances. Like, you know, we'll see you in 20 years with these characters. Luke knows how to build a universe out and maintain the quality. So that's something that we're, you know, we're here for the long, the long haul. So uh, I may have missed this while I was trying to fix things around the um, how, how did Bill get involved? Bill Sienkiewicz. Well, we knew that particularly for the Trader's Revenge story, um, because mm -hmm. that was, you know, that was a bit of a jewel. It was something Stan worked on with us sort of very specifically. We, we wanted 
a legendary artist. We wanted somebody that like, it was, we weren't just going to hand this to anyone. It, it had to be someone special. It had to be someone who could really realize it because it, you know, we were trying to, it, it just, it, it begged for and required someone who thought big and had a wild imagination and, you know, just had a unique artistic vision and that's Bill. And so that was, that was something that we wanted. I mean, we, I mean, how did it come about? Uh, Ryan and I went to Nick, the publisher and said, please, 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 pretty, please go get us Bill. That's, <laughs> that's, that's how that works. <laughs> Nick has such strong relationship with creators. Cause he's such a, he's, he's, he's such a creator friendly publisher that that's one of yes. why people mm -hmm. like Bill will, will work with him. And with us and, you know, for also the other side of it is, you know, Bill had such a huge impact on Marvel publishing, but had never actually worked on a Stan script before. So this was a way to sort of bring that together. And in our minds, you know, it, it, it sort of mirrors what we were hoping to achieve with alliances, which is, you know, the North Star for us with, with orphans particularly was um, the Silver Surfer Parable, like which is now known as Parable with the Mobius um, yeah, you know, two yeah. here. So like, that was like our North star. And it's like, who can we, what kind of artists could we get? That's, you know, can render these images this way. And that's, that was bill. So, um, you know, we, we look at traders revenge in a similar light as that. And, and how, okay. So how, I'm sure you also his interior. Yeah. Bill, bill, bill's interiors. Yes. That's right. The, for the comments, it's bills doing the interiors yeah. for traders revenge, which is oh, also part of, or and the cover, you did the cover too. Yeah, that covers by Bill. You, oh my gosh, it's beautiful. And how many pages would would that be then, for that particular part that Bill did? Oh, there's fifteen or sixteen, Something, fourteen to sixteen, somewhere in there. 16, I don't, you know, six, sixteen, I think, is what it is. Okay. Yeah. So you guys have done auto, Audible, a prose novel, and now the comic book. What's next for this particular world? Video games? That'd be nice. Probably I mean, yeah, we're, we're sort of always playing um, like AR and VR in particular play such a large role in this that when the, what was it Google that came out with the glasses? Like we, we're always sort of like, wait, I mean, there's lots of things we want to do. We're going to publish more and, you know, obviously get into film and TV, but like it, like my dream of dreams, I'm just kind of waiting for the AR and VR to come along enough and sort of be you know have enough user base and stuff like that for us to really be able to play in that space with some of this stuff too because that's that's where a lot of the story lives so it kind of naturally lends itself i mean the main one of the main characters in so the inventor's greatest invention is neo which is this alien artificial intelligence and um which you'll see sort of conceived in 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 traitor's revenge um but she's also one of the main characters in trick of light and um so AI is definitely something we've been sort of it's playing around with for a long time. It's we've had a lot of curiosity around it. Stan had a lot of curiosity around it. Um, you know, I mean, the book came out before chat GTP and everything like that blew up. It was just kind of, he could just kind of see around the corner to where this was all going. And um, the way that human beings are going to interact with AI, I think is going to be a big part of the future. And that's sort of, that's, that's one of the main ideas that we're sort of toying with in this universe. For for us, we're we're committed to like like Luke said, like this is a commitment to each medium we work in. So you know mm -hmm. we're going to continue to expand publishing and audio and comics, and you know we have because of the I, I'll say it again, the nature of the way we develop this, we have an incredible opportunity to bring new characters to audiences in ways that we haven't quite seen before, like immersive entertainment. But you know you mentioned Broadway plays, I'm not sure we're there yet, but um, you know we have things that could work in that kind of space. Um, it's a pretty interesting, you know, toolbox we've been working from for the last, you know, decade or so. Um, but it's exciting. And, you know, the Kickstarter is our, my first, it's my first opportunity to do a Kickstarter. I've never done one before. So this is like, I thought really fun. And it's also a fun way to engage with the fans. Yeah. So uh, I guess yeah, I was kind of joking about the Broadway plays, but the, you never know where these things are going to go, honestly. Stranger, no Stranger Things. Stranger Things is on Broadway, I think. Is it? It's <laughs> coming to Broadway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Back to the Future is, uh, coming to, is on Broadway. Yeah, my brother's going to go. See, I'm so jealous about that. It's one of my favorite <laughs> movies. 
<laughs> my brother's right. going to see this September. Oh my gosh! Uh, I mean, I don't know. So, if, I don't know if Broadway is going to be our first stop, but you know, we're happy to we're, we're happy to play in in all the different mediums. The uh, the, so then this this leads. This is a good segue because I wanted to go back to Red Sonia really quick. So then, how much do you or how involved would you be in something like the Red Sonia movie, for example, the one that's uh, current? I think it's in production, right? No, we're in post. Um, post. Okay. And I was involved. I'm a producer on the film. So, you know, that's I, awesome. I, uh, from scripting to, but I mean, you know, the thing is that you do, there's a balance because when you have a writer that's going to write your script or you have a director that's directing production on a film or what have you, mm-hmm. in each case, you need to give them a certain space to be able to do their best work. And this is true when you bring a writer onto a comic book too, right? You don't want to micromanage them because if they're really creative people, one, they won't tolerate it. And two, um, you're not going to get their, your best work out of them by trying to like, just make them your instrument that doesn't work. They have to have their own originality. And, and so there's this kind of dynamic that's involved when you're working with people uh, and teams of people on projects where you have a way of um, you have to, put some boundaries up, particularly around sort of respect and integrity for the character itself or for the, for the IP or for whatever the story is that's being told. Um, And then you have to kind of, you know, if you love something, you must let it free, you know? So you have to also give them the freedom and some artistic license in order to do their best work and, and be the most creative uh, that they can be. That's a great, you know, and, and that and that 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 is that is how Stan worked. And I see there's a question here about mm-hmm. Stan's creative process. And that is, I don't think Stan gets short change for anything. I think one of the things that's amazing about Stan, I'll say this as a collector, we just talked about Captain America three, right? That's the first time he wrote anything in comics, and it was a prose piece. Now, what did he do that was so amazing there? He took something that was already existing, Captain America, and had him throw his shield. Now you could have had anybody throw his shield before that, but Stan could see that like, what a cool idea this is to throw the shield. So Stan was also just somebody who could build upon what was what also some things that are already existing, like Captain America. But then you move forward and you get Captain America 12 or five, and you see Stan come in as an editor and you see him as a scripter. You know, his multifaceted nature, I think is what made him certainly in our process together, such a such such a like a legend because you're looking at him and you're saying how can you have all those hats like and he would just kind of well, pivot you'd wa- you'd watch it happen you'd be like you'd see him start writing something and then he'd pivot right back to like being an editor giving us critique it was just mm-hmm. a very interesting experience by the time we were working with him on this too he was in his late 80s so i mean he was yeah. um like one of the most sort of wizened experienced storytellers in the world at that point. I mean, just from all different aspects that he was involved in the storytelling and how many stories he'd been involved in telling over how many years with how many collaborators. I mean, he just, he just, it was all sort of instinct at that point with him. Like he, he, you know, it was all so ingrained in him because he'd been doing it for so long and he could game out where the story should go or where you're going to run into a problem. You know, I mean, he can tell you, uh, well, if we go this direction with this, then what you're going to do is you're going to paint yourself into a corner over here. So let's not do that. Here's a better way to do this thing. You know, he could, he could do that. And he was also very, um, like he was very forthright with his opinions. He didn't really couch stuff. I mean, he just, he was there to, to work and to kind of tell us to get the storytelling as best as it could be. And he, and he didn't really, um, you know, I, I noticed when we were talking about giving notes, like when you give notes to directors and writers and stuff like that, a lot of times you'll see them come out of a studio couch and all this, like, we love everything you just did, except for this one thing. And it's all, you're so brilliant, but here's the one thing we'd like to say, or here are our notes. And, you know, Stan wasn't really like that. He would, you know, he would just be like, yeah, that's pretty good, but here's what I think we should do. You know, I mean, he would, he would just kind of dive right in and, and like cut straight to it, you know? I, oh my gosh! Yeah, you, you you mentioned him having so many hats. Like, I, it, it's crazy the amount of things that he was kind of involved in, right? Everything from like, oh my gosh, manga, <laughs> Power Rangers, the whole deal with Toei Animation. It, it's just insane how how he thought. 
Like, I mean, he, working in World War II with Dr. Seuss, as I learned with him and Luke. Yeah. You know, it's like this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. He was, I mean, for the audience, he was writing. Luke was a war pamphlets or like pamphlets. For he was um, army when he something. was when he went uh, joined the army for World War II. He's one of nine people in history whose military designation was a playwright. And they put him in a unit that made it was the uh, training film division. So they made films, but they made other things. And they were like training pamphlets and entertainment and sort of, you know, material for the troops. Um, and that was his job. And the other people in the unit, I mean, there was uh, Theodore Geisel. There was Charles Adams, created the Adams family. There's Frank Capra as a director. They had this murderer's row of talent working in the U.S. Army in, uh, for World War II. And he was still the kid. Stan was always at the early part of his career. He was so like ahead of, I mean, he was, you know, I mean, when, when did he become editor at Timely? He was like well, 18, 18 or 19, thing, but... something like that. And, you know, and he was yeah. still a kid, you know, relatively speaking, the other, the other creators there were in their early twenties and he was still in his teens, you know? That's why I think omnibuses are so valuable because it gives so much context to like, once you see something in like that, it wasn't how comics are intended necessarily like the onset, but like, then you see it like in this large format with all the stuff together and you start seeing the patterns. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is with these collections or the Marvel masterworks is like, check out the, uh, the introductions. Cause a lot of the, a lot of the creators, uh, when they were writing the introductions, you know, they were like, really good memories as to where things were back then. Uh, Roy Thomas mm. is one of my favorite, like, oh my gosh, you get him writing a Conan introduction. It's like eight pages detailed, like remembering what happened to some of the pages, remembering the inkers, remember the, the feuds between the artists. Like it was, it's just insane. And it's like a time capsule. Yeah. Uh, there's some, there's some stuff I can't like share here too much, but when, when Stan passed on, one of my first phone calls was to Roy. Um, and I didn't realize it, but Roy was, he was one of the last people to see Stan. He was there within 48 hours before, uh, Stan passed. And I called him. I didn't know that at the time. I just called him because I wanted someone who could talk to me about a time in Stan's life that I wasn't around for. You know, I, I didn't know Stan in the eighties and the seventies. I didn't, I didn't know him. And, you know, he could just sort of give you stories and it's, you know, private, so I'm not going to share it here, but he could give you all these stories about sort of Stan in the bullpen and, you know, the history of it and all, you know, it was, yeah, Roy, Roy is a, Roy is a bit of a wellspring, you know, we are, we're very blessed. We still have him around. I mean, seriously, he's one of the, he, from that, from that era and to have that kind of memory. Oh my gosh. Like I'd, I'd love for him to do an introduction for every freaking book. Like, while he's still with us and I, we we did uh he did shoot a video for the uh the panel i'm doing for the 50th anniversary right. panel at comic-con we've got a, a video that he shot for us it's not he's not going on for 20 minutes or anything but he's a, i, I could know. listen to him for 20 minutes <laughs> talk about these characters I, I love listening to him talk about these things uh yeah 50, yeah, 50 years right 50 years of, of red sonia that's crazy um, hopefully we'll have, you know, another 50 and then, and then 50 years of Alliance. So you guys can, uh, share your thoughts. That would be cool. Uh, so besides the two of you, uh, can you tell me a little bit about the, the artist that's involved, uh, besides Bilson Cabbage, the main Amen. artist. Amen. Mm -hmm. Ryan, you can probably, uh, buzz off his credits yeah. faster than I can. Cause you know, seem to know yeah. him off. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Sleeman's just, I mean, I mean, in terms of working artists today, I mean, he is extraordinary. I mean, look at it, the bench that he started with. He started on Bendis as Superman and then like moved on to like doing the art with like the X-Men re reboot. Um, you know, I think he did Fallen Angels and he's got creator owned stuff. He just started his launch a creator owned comic and image this, this month. I mean, guy is, and in terms of just his ability to conceptualize sci-fi and sort of like, Cronenberg style horror is unusual. Like he has a very unusual sense of style. Um, we were just lucky to have him because we really were looking for that European sort of bent for the rest of the book to sort of give a different sort of flavor to um he came to up Bill's, with some cool, Bill's some, prologue. Some cool conceptions too. I mean, some of the some of the orphans like uh, Little Boy and Hayes, like they require a uh, spawn. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. Did spawn, you know. Yeah. 
Yeah, this spot. His colors are nuts. I love, I love it. Yeah, yeah. The colors are amazing. Um, you know, that's one of the things that when you're working with Dynamite, they really care so much about like putting together. I this is my first, you know, comic book graphic novel, and it was um, amazing to be able to learn about the business with them or through that, through, through their kind of relationships with creators, because, you know, everything from the lettering to the way it was printed was something that, um, you know, a lot of care was put into. So I'm super appreciative. They, they do put out some great books, so I can't wait to see, you know, yeah. what, um, what, it, when people get this uh, book in their hands. So, um, any any last words to people trying to uh, break it into the comic book industry, like as aspiring words? Like I'm sure you guys get asked that a lot. I would use Stan's words that are in that are from my interview that are in the um, that are in the um, this Disney Plus documentary where he said, uh, you know, perseverance is the thing. If you think you've got it, you just mustn't give up. You have to just keep going and going until hoping sooner or later someone will recognize what you've done. Um, and I, to me, there isn't really much of a shortcut here. You know, you have to develop your craft. You have to do it because you love it. It's not the kind of thing that you're going to do, particularly in the comic book business itself. It's not the kind of thing you're going to do because of, uh, you know, fame and fortune is just around the corner. Fame and fortune is something that takes a long time and it's a byproduct of making an excellent product. It's not, uh, it's not the end unto itself, you know? So it, it's, if, if it's something that you love to do and you're willing to really put in the time and dedication. And the other thing I would say is um, the people who tell you your stuff is amazing when you're first starting out, like your mom, they mean well, but they're not necessarily the people you should listen to. Um, and sometimes the people who tell you it sucks are just, are just being assholes. So, you know, it, what you need is you need to find people who can give you the proper, criticism who are honest with you and straight with you and stuff isn't working. Um, but, uh, you know, it's coming from the right place. They're not just trying to tear you down. Um, and if you can find those people, um, and they'll probably expect you to do the same with their creative work. And if you can find those people, that's really valuable. It's a collaborative medium and every medium that I work in is collaborative. And that's part of what Luke's saying, I think is mm -hmm. like, you got to find trusted collaborators, build the team, which is always the most fun part of a movie and a comic book anyways, when the team's getting built. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, really embrace that part of it because this is, it's, it's either the team of collaborators you're going to take with you to your next project or the team of people who are giving you criticism that you're going to keep showing all your projects to whatever it may be. But it's, it's, it's not just made by the single artist in a room, although as much as that's, you know, a beautiful fantasy. <laughs> no, not, it's not what not, not how it goes down in the real world well i mean and that, that was the way that uh stan worked too right i mean he, he right he, he always he always let people know that it was a collab thing you know whether it was working with jack or or, or steve or uh or larry and then of course back then nobody really gave credit to like the colorists or letterers but that wasn't until a few years after the silver age but you know it's just uh i think that's the way it is like it's not just one person working on these things. I mean, you 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 do have a rare case where it is one person working on on the whole thing. But then yeah, those people, those people should make an effort to uh, show that before you show it to everyone, before you sort of put it out for the public and publish it and release it. Mm -hmm. You should probably get some feedback on it along the way from people from from people that you trust because you can get a little. You know, with any kind of creative process, you can get a little inside your own head, you can get a little inside your own world, and you may not be aware of things that, you you know, you wanted a certain point or a certain vibe to get communicated. Maybe it's not coming through, or maybe you're really spending too much time on something else that people aren't that interested in. And so you need, a, you know, you need a, a little bit of, an, you need some impressions from people whose opinion you respect. And just to bring it to, to alliances for orphans, I mean, because somebody here is asking about the characters in here and mm -hmm. the story itself is about um, connection and human connection as mm -hmm. ex exemplified by alien species mm -hmm. in space. Um, but, you know, that that ultimately is about found family and how, you know, people from different kinds of creeds and backgrounds can come together and, you know, again, and and for the common good. And that's one of the fun parts of discovering orphans is how these 
kind of miscreant characters all end up on a ship together, roaming through space to go clean up this inventor's galactic mess, which is very, very fun read, I think. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, I've, I, they, they sent me a copy, which is really nice. So I can't wait to uh, sit down and read it and hopefully do a proper overview. And mm. now, so I, I was in Japan for about 15 days. So I got the book afterwards. Uh, and Vince, um, Vincent Faust, who's my wonderful contact at Dynamite, uh, also sent me the candle. So when I got the candle, I had no idea what it was at first. I was so confused because they didn't come with the book because it was shipped before we left to Japan. Uh, so now, like afterwards, he messaged me uh, when we got back. He's like, hey, did you get the candle in the book? And I'm like, I got the candle. <laughs> and, and I think I, the book is waiting for me at home. So, so now it all makes sense. In, it, when you read the book, in the in the last kind of act of the story, we took some imagery from you know from Japanese culture. I hope you recognize it, but we'll talk about it after you read the book. And if anybody okay. in, the, in, in the fan uh, community can identify it, you feel free to message Luke or I. We'll take a we'll entertain all the guesses at what page it's on. But the art specifically <laughs> should homage some Japanese culture. Well, I, I can't wait to check it out. Um, so I just want to thank you guys and, and apologize again for uh, the internet that was just crapping out, or I think it was my computer. I don't know. Um, I'll get okay, that. It thing. literally happened on the last one we were on too. So just like, <laughs> don't feel bad. <laughs> it seems to be going wrong. And uh, I also would love to have uh, you on again, Luke, uh, to talk about Red Sonia and like sure. uh, possible projects that you know you all are working on. Uh, when and if you can talk about them, of course. Um, so I will definitely hit you up. And a big thank you to Nick for reaching out and uh, suggesting this wonderful interview. Because you guys are – this was really fun. Yeah, just getting to know a lot of the behind the scenes and about the story and how it kind of all came together. Like it's really cool. Uh, because sometimes, I mean, the behind the scenes, the actual stories of how it all happens is, to me, just as good as like sometimes the story uh, that uh, you guys are putting out there. So, Okay. Yeah. Um, but that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for watching. I have left a link in the description of the video. I'm also leaving a link in the chat right now if you want to go and check this out. Um, give me one second here. Are there any differences between the last published orphans versus this Kickstarter? Um, Ryan, you want to tackle it? Well, the, the big the big difference is the splitting off of Trader's Revenge, which is available as an ash can. So that's uniquely for that Kickstarter and exclusive to that Um Kickstarter, the Virgin Art, uh, which is the bill cover, is unique to this Kickstarter. And but the in, but the in terms of the interiors of the book itself, uh, they are the same as the retail as the retail. Uh, in fact, the retail edition is available through the Kickstarter as well. So there you go. Thank you so much for taking that question. Um, Thank you for the question. But that's it, everybody. Stay healthy and safe out there. And thank you to these two gentlemen. Thanks and so much, man. Absolutely.